And you know, just like I was showing those kids there, that, that snake skin that we found by the side of the black kettle, uh, where we, and we, we know that the, the snake has to get rid of the old so that it can live into the new. I want to help us hear that this morning in the gospel, that God calls us to shed the old life so that we can live the resurrected life. And I really want to look at the scripture. If you've got your Bible open, we can just kind of follow right down through it because I want to examine a couple of verses in detail here. Um, this is John chapter 20, one of the resurrection accounts. And uh, Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' closest followers, goes to the tomb. In the other Gospels, we know that she had some other women that accompanied her, at least at some points here. And she goes to the tomb, and she looks in, and she sees that there is, there's, the stone's been rolled away, and that Jesus' body is not present anymore. And so she runs back and gets a hold of the Apostle Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved. And all throughout the Gospel of John, we learn that the disciple who Jesus loved is John, the author of this gospel, who had a, the youngest disciple, had a special relationship with Jesus, and they come running. And uh, they, the disciple, is he's faster than Peter, but he kind of stops at the edge of the tomb. Maybe he doesn't know what's going on. And Peter comes, and he's the daring one. He kind of plunges in and, and looks in and goes into the tomb. Um, and they both look in eventually. In verse 8, the other disciple, he, he, he goes inside too. And we see that he saw and believed. And and he saw and he believed. And we don't know exactly yet what he is believing because it's kind of hard for them and maybe for us to get our minds wrapped around what's going on here in this passage. Um, They see the burial cloth there. They see the other cloth that was um, over the top, the kind of the pall that was over the top of Jesus that has been folded up. Um, And the body is gone. Jesus is gone, but these cloths are there. And, and so he sees and he believed, and we don't know yet what he's believing, but verse 9 explains they, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So they're kind of living into that, but they don't know it all yet. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, we see that as Jesus, uh, Jesus meets two disciples, Cleopas and his wife or his friend, on the road to Emmaus, and he explains to them, everything that was about him in Moses and the prophets, in all of the scriptures. Um, and, and what he's explaining there and what the disciples come to grasp as this, this chapter continues is that the, the scriptures have always pointed the way to what God is doing in history and that it is centered in Jesus Christ, the one who lived and died and was raised again for us, and that God's plan of salvation and God's plan for the world and the formation of his people are all centered in Jesus Christ, and that's what the scriptures say, Um, but they're still living into this, and they they run back, and they tell the other disciples that that the tomb is empty, and Mary stays. Um, Verse 10, they ran back to their homes, but verse 11, Mary stands outside the tomb, and she's crying. She's weeping. And, and she has this, this moment, and you can kind of imagine, that, you know, what, why the, the angels ask her, why is she crying? And you can kind of imagine all of the reasons that she is crying. She, she's crying because she thinks the body's been stolen. It's some kind of a grave robbery. Uh, she thinks that, she thinks that uh, she, well, she has witnessed her, her beloved teacher and friend, Rabbi Jesus, brutally murdered by the powers that be. And she's crying because everything that she has believed about a good and loving God who cares for his people has just kind of come crashing down on her head. Because why, my Lord, have you let this happen to Jesus? And so she's crying, and the angels ask her. You can kind of think of this this state that she's in, and maybe it's a kind of a visionary experience, and she sees these angels through her tears, and they say, why are you crying? And she explains that she doesn't know where her Lord is. And then there's a second question, verse 15. She kind of turns around, and she sees Jesus, but she does not recognize him, and in fact, she thinks that he is a gardener. Um, and, and he asks her the same question, uh, why are you crying, and then who is it that you are looking for? She says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And this is this really powerful moment here in the Gospel of John. It all kind of hinges on this moment, because when he speaks her name, then there is this recognition that happens in Mary's mind, because there is nobody else 
that speaks her name like that. There is nobody who knows her name of names. It's the one who has called the stars into being and named them all. It's the one that knows how many hairs we have on our head. He's the one that cares for us more than anyone else and has proved it by bleeding for us and dying for us and being raised for us. And there he is standing, the risen Lord, the resurrected one who death could not swallow and the tomb could not seal in and Satan could not hold on to. And Jesus burst out of the tomb and those chains went clanging and banging off of Satan's dark bars. And there he is, standing before Mary and he has spoken her name and she recognizes him, Jesus the risen Lord. And she says, Rabboni or Rabuni, which in Aramaic means something like, my dear rabbi, my dear teacher. It's a term of endearment. And in Matthew, we know that Mary falls down at his feet and takes hold of his feet and she worships him. And here, uh, that piece isn't described. In verse 17, Jesus says something kind of mysterious. Do not hold on to me, right? Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God And then Mary Magdalene goes and she spreads the news to the rest of the disciples. But we have this moment where where Jesus says, do not hold on to me. And we got to ask ourselves, what is this really about? I mean, what's with holding on? Why doesn't Jesus want her to hang on to him? And and you know, I'm struck by in the scriptures how oftentimes in the New Testament, there is this imagery of when we are going to enter into the new life, then first we've got to let go of the old. And I wonder if that's kind of what's going into play here, where Jesus is saying, yeah, you know, I am your rabbi. I am your friend. I am this one that you have gotten to know over nearly three years, but don't hold on to that image because I am more than that now. I am the risen Lord. And you'll notice a couple of verses later that Mary, when she goes and talks to the disciples, she doesn't say, Gee, I, uh, uh, the tomb is empty and I have seen um, the, the, the rabbi. She says, I have seen the Lord. Right? So in her mind, that transformation has already happened. And so Jesus, I think, is telling her, don't hang on to that old image. You're going to have to give that up. You're going to have to shed that and live into this new reality because everything has changed. I have broken the power of death and defeated death, and now there's this new reality that God is calling his people into. Our, my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And in the Scriptures, We see a lot of times that the old has to be set aside if we're going to enter into the new. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, put on the the compassion, and you put on the new. And in 1 Peter 5.5, he talks about about putting on humility. Um, In the the Apocrypha, in the book of Baruch, he speaks to the, the... people of Israel and says that we have to put off our, the garment of sorrow and affliction. and We've got to put on the glory and the beauty of God. We've got to take off the old life if we're going to put on the new life. And Paul says it best in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about this perishable body that must put on imperishability and this mortal body that must put on immortality. And so here, here is Jesus talking to Mary and saying to Mary, you got to take off that old, shed that old image, and enter into this new image of who I am, because this is not a one-off thing. This isn't like Lazarus. This isn't just where one person got out from the dead. I am changing everything. We've got to be ready to shed the old, kind of like those snakes that I showed the kids. We've got to shed the old so that we can live into the new. And you know, this is not easy. Right? Giving up the old and coming into the, the new. Um, this, this goes for the old life, and I think it's part of the message of Easter that, that we enter into the new life by getting rid of the old. And this is not easy. Um, and it's not easy because um, a lot of times what, what is old to us is, is destructive to us, but it's still something that defines us because we are sinners, and we can't imagine our life without that sin because it gives us some meaning and it kind of uh, lets, uh, gives us some identity and we can't give it up. And, and so, you know, sometimes there are things in our old life that are hard to give up. And, you know, I think if we're going to be able to live into the new life, then we've got to be able to shed the old. And that takes a special kind of trust. 
uh, Jesus, Jesus really points the way. I mean, there's a kind of a trust that we've got to have to live this new life. And you know, it's not just a, a new life um, that comes after we die. It's not just something about eternal life. It's also a life that begins right here and now. It's a, a quality of life that we live. It's life lived in Him. Um, and that, that is why we enter it as Christians through baptism. And there's no, which is something we do and continue our lives, and it's part of our faith journey. And it's no coincidence that in the ancient church, people who were baptized, um, in some places at least, would be baptized naked. They'd get rid of the old, walk down into the water, and then come up and would put on a white robe, a new white robe, to symbolize their new life in Christ. And that's why the baptismal tanks in some ancient churches aren't up in front. They're off in a side room or even in a little separate building. Um, But the old has to be set aside if we're going to enter into the new life. We can't fight in Saul's armor. Um, The new wine will just burst those old wineskins. And it takes trust. We've got to follow Jesus on this. It takes trust. And I think um, it's trust that Jesus is the one who is completing the work that he accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection. That's what John's talking about there, what Jesus says in John when Jesus is ascending to the Father. He's completing the wholeness of that work. It takes trust that he's doing that. Um, and the, the first kind of trust, I think, really, is that we should actually let go. And, you know, we got, we got to shed it. We got to shed the old stuff um, and we got to shed those things that are destructive to us. And, and Pastor Rick Warren puts it this way. He says, you will not experience transformation until you are dissatisfied with your current reality. Right? we, we got to believe that our current reality is not sufficient, that we are not living into what God has for us in the new life that God has promised and opened up in Jesus. And you know what? Most of the time, we, we don't believe that. We, we've got to, to take seriously that if we're going to embrace the new life that is in Jesus, we're going to have to get rid of the old and dead parts of us, the sin sickness in us. Um, we've got to believe that we're going to have to be really and truly dead, but most of the time, we don't think we're, we're that dead. Um, we don't think there's that big of an issue to deal with. And, and we've got to believe that we've got to let go. And that is not easy, right, to, to let go, because, you know, like I was saying, sometimes... Even things that are destructive to us, we hang on to those habits because they kind of have formed us and give us our identity. And you know, I mean this in a big sense when we think about setting down the old life and living into the new life in Jesus, but I also mean just in the in in the immediate, right? In our day-to-day walk as human beings before the living God, how do we sometimes get called to set down things in order to more fully live into the life of Christ? All those little places where we feel God is working something in us, something's changing, um, and we don't want to let go of it, right? All those little places where we need God's grace. And you know, I was researching about snake skins, right? And trying to learn something about how snakes shed their skins. And one thing I found out is that as snakes, um, when, they, when they, you know, a pet snake or when they come out of the, their hibernation in the winter and get ready to shed their skins, they can't see very well. And then they get kind of grumpy and testy. And, and it, says, um, it says, don't try to handle them when they're about to shed their skin because they don't like that. Well, you know what? Sometimes when we feel God calling us and convicting us of something. You know what I mean by conviction? When God just lays something on our hearts that this has got to change, this situation, this way you're living, this way you're thinking or whatever. Sometimes when we have that conviction, we can be a little bit like those snakes that are, they sense a change is happening, but it makes us kind of grumpy. And, you know, and then we kind of get defensive, right, and kind of test you. I mean, think about if, if God is calling you to, to not be judgmental about a certain class of people or whatever, and, and if you're anything like me, the first thing that you do is start to think of lots of reasons why you're justified in being judgmental, right? And, and you're right to, to have this dim view of a certain person or a certain kind of people. And you get kind of testy and kind of grumpy because you feel that there is some kind of a change coming on and that that old skin won't handle it anymore, and God's calling us to shed that and take on the new. 
And a lot of times it's not easy for us to give that stuff up, and it kind of hurts. Um, and we kind of got to scratch it off and shed it and enter into the new life. But there's another piece to this, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I mean, it's kind of the crazy thing, and this is a little bit where Mary was at. Sometimes we've got to trust God to let go of beautiful things, of, of things that are good in our lives in order for God's resurrection, uh, new life to, to spring forth within us. And, you know, this one really requires trust because it's easy to say, get the bad stuff out and bring the, new, the good stuff in, right? Get rid of death, hang on to life. But sometimes we've got to shed even some good things in our lives. And who in their right mind shed something beautiful? I mean, and this, this is Mary, right? Because she's looking at Jesus and she's thinking, this is perfect. You've come back from the dead. God has justified you and vindicated you and death could not hold you. And now we can just go back out on the road and live that life that we were living. All of us disciples together. You're the rabbi. We're the students. The kingdom of God's breaking in, healing and casting out demons and teaching and preaching. And that's a good thing. All of that is good. But Jesus says, don't hang on to me. And I think it's because she's got to give up that image of what was in order to grasp on to this deeper image of what is happening now in him. And that's our situation, or at least it's something I've experienced, that sometimes we've got to give up even things that are good and beautiful and right and true and lovely in our lives in order to live into something deeper that God is calling us to. Maybe we've got to give up some comfort because God is calling us to, to go beyond our comfort zone. Uh, maybe we've got to, to, to give up um, some expectations and hopes and plans that we have, because God has other plans for us. Sometimes we give up things that are good in order to really live into what God is, is planning for us. We've got to shed the old and live into what God is calling us to. Something big, new life, resurrection. And, you know, I think there's another kind of trust that we've got to have if we're going to shed the old and live into the new life. And it really it, uh, goes like this, that we've got to have trust that, that God is better at resurrection than we are. And maybe that kind of sounds crazy to you, kind of strange. But, you know, a lot of times I think we're tempted to try to accomplish resurrection on our own, and, and we're never really going to be successful in pulling that off. And I think in a, a very basic sense, this is what Peter was talking about when he wrote in his second letter, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. I mean, it's just saying that God really knows what we need, even better sometimes than, than we know, and trusting him on that. And, and this is not easy. I mean, it is not easy to believe that God knows better than, than we do what we really need. Um, we can't even imagine that stuff. Author Eugene Peterson writes this. He says, Sin shrinks our imaginations. If we calculate the nature of the world by what we can manage or explain, we end up living in a very small world. This is the word that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, that God is doing abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. And so God is saying, let go of some of that stuff and trust that I am going to bring about resurrection in your life and the way that you need it. And the, and the, I'm going to bring to life in you that which I desire to see in you. And so it's don't just hold on to the rabbi, Mary. Uh, it's Jesus saying, I'm the risen Lord now. And this changes everything. And you see this as Jesus is dealing with the different apostles as he is appearing to them in the, the stories that come after this chapter. I mean, he appears to Thomas. You remember this story. And he says, to, to, first Thomas doesn't believe, but then Jesus appears to him and he says, Thomas, touch my hands. Put your hand in my, in my side and see that it is me. And Thomas falls on the ground and he bows down and he says, my Lord and my God. Jesus was calling him beyond his doubt and resurrecting in him this new life. Uh, Jesus speaks to Peter and you know, Peter had betrayed him and it would be easy to cast Peter off as a lost cause. But Jesus tells him to, to forget about that stuff and shed that 
that stuff and to feed my lambs at the end of John. I mean, it's get out and walk on the water all over again, Peter. And, and, you know, Jesus deals with his people just like this, calling them beyond what they know and saying, I will resurrect in you what you need. Trust me on that. And you know what? Maybe you're at a point where you cannot imagine this kind of resurrection or this kind of trust. And maybe you'd, you'd like to believe it, but, but you can't, right? Because how is God going to be able to know what we need in our lives? And I think this is a step of faith to get to this point where we really are able to let go of something and, and trust that God will bring about the resurrection that we need at the right time. But, you know, I'm struck by the, the pivotal moment in this passage, which is really verse 17 there where Jesus speaks to Mary, and he just says her name, Mary. It's when he speaks her name that she recognizes who he is and what is happening and who he is about. And it's at that moment where she begins to let go of the old and to place her trust in the new life that he is bringing about. And I'm, I'm, I'm convicted by this because it's when Jesus speaks her name. Jesus knows her name. Jesus knows our names. Jesus knows your name. He knows you intimately and deeply. He was there when you were formed in the womb. He will meet you on the other side of the tomb. Jesus knows our names, and he will bring about the resurrection life in us that we need. And that is a step of faith to, to enter into that, but he truly knows that. He knows our hurts, and he, he knows our wounds, and he comes to each of us in our lives individually, and he, he knows our places of brokenness and our weaknesses, and he knows where we've been wronged. He knows the, the, the rancor that we carry in our hearts, and he knows what needs to be fixed and what needs to die, and he will bring about the word of resurrection within us that we need, just like he did for Mary. It's just like he said to Lazarus back in chapter 12, Lazarus, come out. He will do that within our lives. He will call our name and call us out of death and out of destruction and into new life. He'll say to Mary, Mary, it's me. He said to Thomas, touch my hands and my said. He said to Peter, touch, feed my sheep. Jesus meets us in our lives with his resurrection power. He calls each of us by name and meets us all on our, where we're at. And he's calling your name. He is speaking to you. And he is inviting you to know him more deeply and put your trust in him and to walk with him and to experience his resurrection power now and in the life to come. He's saying, I was raised for you. And you know what, brothers and sisters? That is the message of Easter. Jesus died, Jesus was raised, but all of it for us for us as the church, for us as the world, for us as God's people, but for each of us individually, he was raised for us and he's calling us to let go of the old, shed it, and live in to the resurrected life. Glory be to God. Amen.